Hey, my name is Milan, and in this video we're going to talk about guaranteeing uniqueness in a concurrent environment. We're going to see how race conditions can cause a problem, how we can solve this using distributed locking, and as a bonus, I'm going to show you a very simple solution to solve this using just our relational database. Let's take a look at a use case for registering a user inside of our system. And this is a very common operation for most web APIs out there, where you have a new user that wants to register with your system. They're going to provide a first and last name, so some personal information, and then an email that's going to uniquely identify this user along with a password so that they can securely authenticate with your system. And the email component, which should be unique, is where we run into a problem. So if we take a look at the handle method, which implements this use case, the first check is reaching out to the database and seeing if a user exists with this particular email. If this returns true, it means we already have a user registered with this email and we can't allow duplicates. So we're going to throw an exception. This can be bubbled up to some global exception handler that's going to handle this and return an appropriate response. Otherwise, we're going to create a user, hash the user's password, add the user to the database, and everything is great. Except we have a race condition here, and without any mechanisms in place inside of our database to guarantee uniqueness, this could be problematic. We could have concurrent requests getting past this condition and managing to create a user and insert that user into the database. Let me illustrate this with an example. The overarching topic of this video is going to be guaranteeing uniqueness in the face of concurrency. And you will see why uniqueness in general isn't a very simple problem, although we have some very nice ways to guarantee uniqueness in a simple way. So let's check out our example. We have two users that are interacting with our API. The first user reaches out to the API and checks if this email is available. Then we have the second user reaching out to the API using the same email address. Our API is going to check the database, figure out that this email isn't currently in use, and reply yes to the first user. Then it's going to reply yes to the second user, and in the meantime, the first user is going to register with our system, and everything will be stored in the database. Then the second user attempts to do the same, and if we don't have any other checks in place, this is going to succeed, and we end up with our system in an invalid state. And this is definitely not what we want. So how do you solve this? Well, let's go back to our code, and we're going to explore a few ways for how we can solve this in a simple environment where we have only one application instance, as well as in a distributed system where we could have any number of application instances all trying to do the same operation concurrently. Let's start with the simplest approach, which is using a locked statement. So what you can do is create a new lock object, and then inside of our use case, we can invoke the lock statement, specify our lock object and we essentially want to place the critical section which is the entire use case into the lock statement now a problem that you will quickly run into is that you can't use async await inside of the body of the lock statement so we have to scrap this solution an alternative would be using something like a semaphore so let's go with a semaphore or we can even do a semaphore slim I'm going to create a new semaphore instance and I'm going to instantiate it with an initial count of one and a maximum count of one. This is also called a mutex because only one thread can enter the critical section. Now, how you would use this is say if semaphore wait async, you can specify an optional timeout. And if this succeeds, then you have successfully entered the critical section. If it doesn't succeed, then you didn't acquire a lock and you have to either retry or return a failure to the user. Now, in this case, we can take the critical section and move it inside of the if statement here. And this time we can use async await. So this is a benefit of using the semaphore. Now I'm going to invert this if statement. If we can't enter the semaphore, then let's just throw an exception and otherwise we're going to leave everything else. So let's just throw an exception and we can say, please try again later. We also need to take care of releasing the semaphore even in case of some unexpected exceptions. So let's wrap this in a try finally statement. And in the finally block, I'm going to say semaphore release. And this would be a very simple way to guarantee uniqueness 
if we don't have any checks in place in our database. Now we're going to discuss this later, but let's discuss some drawbacks of this solution. First of all, we are using a static semaphore instance. This means that the semaphore only exists in the context of our application instance. If we are in a distributed environment, then this won't work. This is just a simple in-memory lock inside of our application. Another issue with this approach is that it essentially reduces the concurrency of the register use case to one. We can only have one request at a time attempting to register a user, so we could improve on this slightly by trying to lock based on the email value, but let's not explore this approach, and I want to show you a solution that's going to work in a distributed environment. So let's revert everything to the state that it was when we started this discussion, and now let's talk about distributed locking. Distributed locking allows us to acquire a lock that's going to work in a distributed system. A popular solution is a NuGet package called Redlock, which uses Redis to implement a distributed lock, but if you are using a database like Postgres, you can leverage a very nice feature inside of Postgres called advisory locks. Postgres advisory locks work on the connection or transaction level. So let's go ahead and open up a database transaction. I'm going to say await using var transaction, and I'm going to use my database context to access the database facade and call the begin transaction method. And this is going to return a database transaction. Now, when I'm done with making my changes, which is after save changes async, I can say transaction commit async. And if we run into an exception, our transaction won't be committed. And once the transaction is disposed, because we have a using statement here, it's going to roll back any changes. So our system ends up in a consistent state in case of an unexpected error. Now let's see how we can leverage the Postgres advisory lock feature. Advisory locks acquire a lock on a numeric value. So I can define some constant that could be inside of the use case. It could also be on the class or we could have something more meaningful than this, but a simple value like this works just fine. And then let's create a Boolean variable that I will call lock acquired. And how we're going to get this value is by running another database query. I will say context database SQL query, and I want to return a Boolean value from this query. Now I'm going to write a simple statement. And what we have to do is say select PG for Postgres, try advisory lock. And this is a function that allows us to obtain an advisory lock for this identifier. I'm going to pass in the lock ID as the argument. And because this is an interpolated string, this is going to be converted into a proper parameter when it's sent to our database. This is made possible using the formatable string type, which is the argument to the SQL query method. I will also have to cast this as a value when returning this response so that I can say first async. And finally, we can just check if we manage to acquire the lock, then we have what we wanted. We acquired a distributed lock and we can proceed to register the user. So I'm going to negate this because I prefer not nesting my code. And if we didn't acquire a lock, let's throw an exception and say, please try again later. So this solution here is going to work in a distributed system because this is a distributed lock. However, this is running under the assumption that your user service which would probably be responsible for registering a user, is going to be using the same database under the hood. If you have multiple Postgres databases in a sharded environment, then you run into a similar problem like we had with a semaphore. But let's assume that we are just using one database and using an advisory lock is just fine. When we complete our transaction here, the advisory lock will be released and some other requests will be able to acquire the lock and register a user. So the advantage of this approach over the semaphore is that it works in a distributed environment because this is a distributed lock. However, we have two problems. First of all, we have to write some verbose code, although this could just as easily be an extension method and we can abstract away all the details, but it also has the same problem as the semaphore where it reduces the concurrency of the register user use case. So is there another way to solve this that guarantees uniqueness and doesn't reduce the concurrency of our implementation? Well, there is, and I'm going to get rid of everything we had here. And let's again go back to our initial state for the register user use case. The user entity that we have in our code, which we are mapping in the database, has an email property. And this property is mapped to a respective column in the database. So you might be tempted that we should somehow be using our domain model to enforce concurrency. And this isn't really the case. There's an excellent book that I recommended you read. It's called Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture. 
and it was written way back in 2002 by Martin Fowler. One of the patterns that is mentioned inside of this book is the domain model pattern, which we can also tie into domain-driven design because they are somewhat related, and the domain-driven design book is even mentioned in this chapter of the Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture book. And the main use case for having a domain model is for complicated and ever-changing business rules involving validation, calculations, and derivations. However, uniqueness isn't an ever-changing rule. It's something that we always want to enforce, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to push this into the domain model. So it's finally time to reveal the best, in my opinion, and simplest solution to guaranteeing uniqueness, and that's using our relational database. To be more specific, we're going to use a unique constraint, and another way that we can achieve this is by introducing a unique index. So I will open up the user configuration, which is the fluent configuration for my EF core entity, in this case the user. And here I can say builder has index, specify the user's email as the column that I want to index in the database. And I want this index to be unique. The next thing I have to do is to create a new EF core migration, which you can see here. This migration is going to call the create index command is going to create an index with this name on the users table and the email column, and it's also going to be a unique index. So this is going to be applied on my database when I start the application. Now let's go back to our use case. How are we going to use the fact that we now have a unique constraint with a respective index on the users table? If we do run into a rare situation where we have a race condition and two concurrent requests try to call save changes for the same email, one of them is going to fail. A unique index in the database is quote unquote thread safe, which means that only one transaction will be able to insert the email into the database and the other one is going to throw an exception. So you can go ahead and wrap the context save changes async call into a try catch statement and the exception that EF core throws is a database update exception. However, there's more than one reason to throw this exception. So how can we be sure that this is because of a unique constraint violation? Well, you can add a when statement after the catch and here I can add a condition on the database update exception and what I want to check is that the inner exception is an mpg sql exception because I'm using the postgres provider for ef core and I want to check the sql state property and the value I'm looking for is postgres error codes unique violation and this is a specific error code that will be assigned in the mpg sql exception when we run into this situation when we land in the catch statement i'm going to throw an exception saying that the email is already in use and we can also include the database update exception as the inner exception to include some more details and now let's start the application and i want to show you how this works when we run into a database update exception so let's try to register a new user with this email address and there's already a user in the database using the same email. So if I send this request, we will land on the breakpoint inside of my use case. And this check is going to see that there's an existing email with this specific email address, and we will proceed to throw an exception. But let's artificially invoke a race condition by moving to the next line of code, which is going to try to create a new user, add it to the context, and then it will call save changes async. And you will see that I'm encountering a database update exception and eventually I land in the catch statement. And this is because if I open up the exception and we take a look at the inner exception, you can see that the SQL state property, which is somewhere here, here it is, it has the value of 23,505, which is the exact value specified in Postgres error codes for the unique violation. So if I press continue, we will get an exception bubbled up to the Swagger UI is going to say the email is already in use. The inner exception is going to be a database update exception, which encapsulates the respective Postgres exception, which is how we know that this is a duplicate key violation on the unique constraint that we have on this index. Now, an added benefit of having an index is performance, and all of our queries that are referencing the user's email address are going to be much faster inside of our database. So this is going to be our final solution in the register user use case. We are leveraging a unique index inside of our database to guarantee uniqueness on the email. This also works in a concurrent environment because only one transaction is able to actually insert a specific email into the database. It doesn't reduce the overall concurrency of our system because we can have any number of users trying to register and it works in a distributed environment 
assuming that all of our services are using the same database under the hood. If you want to learn more about concurrency and what problems it can cause, then you should watch this video next about optimistic concurrency control. Check out my courses to improve your software architecture skills, and until next time, stay awesome.